Okay, Booker Tov, everybody. All right. Okay, welcome to class number 35 in our uh, ongoing series on the sitter. Thank you for coming. I uh, hope everybody's doing well. Okay, so last week we started Baruch Shamar. And um, uh, we went through a little bit at the beginning. We'll continue, hopefully finish most of it. I just, uh, I, I didn't mention last week, but the um, um, the commentary of the Torah Tamima, that's Rav Baruch Halevi Epstein on the Siddur. He has a cute commentary. He was a fascinating figure. He died around 1940, I believe. And I believe in America, I think he was a banker eventually. He was the nephew of, of the Nitziv, the great Rosh Hashiva in, in the uh, the, father, the son of the Aruch Ashokhan, Rav Yechiel Michal Epstein, who wrote this a very important modern code of Jewish life. And um, and uh, he, uh, he was a he was a fascinating figure. We'll we'll, we'll leave it at that. Um, and um, so his commentary on you'll even hear by what he says what I mean that his commentary in the city is called Baruch Shamar, which is of course a play on the words Baruch Shamar. And he writes the reason he's calling it Baruch Shamar is because a to give thanks to God Baruch Shamar by Alam God is the creator of the world, but also you know he wants to mention his name. His name is Baruch Baruch Levi Epstein. And, uh, and then he quotes the verse um, that, that we say in the Haftorah on the fast days, the beautiful Haftorah from Yeshayahu, Shem Olam Eitein Lo, Akoamar Shem Lasarisim, God says to the people who can't have kids, I'll give you a great thing, Tov Mi Banim, I'll give you a Yad Vashem, Tov Mi Banim Mi Banot, we mentioned that's why Yad Vashem is called Yad Vashem, for people who unfortunately couldn't were killed, couldn't have, have children, God will give them a Yad Vashem. So that's uh, where the, of course, the Holocaust Memorial came. And then it says, Shem Olam I'll give them a permanent name. I'll give the person a permanent name. So the Gemara and one interpretation says, what does it mean to have a, a permanent name? Shem Olam Eitenlo. So the Gemara says, it means when a person writes a book and, uh, and the book is called by their name. So that book is a permanent record, right? That's the difference between the written law and the oral law. What is written is permanent. It says, for the examples, say for Daniel. Say for, that's the example that Mara uses. Say for Daniel, that gives Daniel like sort of a place and permanence in all of Jewish history. So uh, therefore, he's going to call his book Baruch Shamar. So people will know that uh, Baruch Halevi Epstein, you know, uh, once lived and wrote a commentary on the Chumash. It's kind of interesting because I don't know that anybody who just picked up the book heard Baruch Shamar would think of Baruch HaLevi Epstein. But anyways, it's it, it's interesting. It, it just He just writes it in the last paragraph. He writes a small introduction to his book. It's little comments he made. I'll, yeah, I'll, I'll just say one uh, when I say he's a, a fascinating figure. I, I may mention this what sometime in the past, uh, one of these things, because we just had the holiday of, of Shavuot. So the Torah Tamima wants to know why when we make the bracha, you know, every yontif has its own uh, special, you know, it's chag kamat, we say, right, so, um, Pesach is man cheirutenu, and shukot is mamatan toratenu, and sukot is man simchatenu, everybody, every holiday has a particular theme we focus on, so why does the bracha, the ending bracha is always supposed to make mention of of, of the theme. One of the rules in a bracha is so we, we, we make habdalah. So we say, Hamavdil ben Kodesh Chol. So we end, Baruch Hashem, Hamavdil ben Kodesh Chol. We say the end and the, the beginning. Um, and every bracha, that Ata Chonein Ladam Dat, Baruch Hashem Chonein Hadat. You know, Slach Lanu Harotzeh Bichuva. Every bracha is supposed to go back to the original theme and say the same thing. So why on Yontif? Do, don't we do that? On Yontif, uh, Pesach, Shavu, and Sukkot, we have a, a generic bracha, Mekadesh Yisrael, the Azamani. God sanctified the Jewish people and the times. The time, it's a holy time, it's Yontif. Whereas uh, on Rosh Hashanah, we say, Melech al Kol Arts, Mekadesh Yisrael, Yom Hazikaron. God is the master of the world. He sanctifies the day of remembrance. And on Yom Kippur, we say, Melech Mochel Vasolech, Lavanoteinu. God is the forgiving God. So why don't we say, Mekadesh Yisrael, Bechak Hamatzot, or say something like that? So the Torah Mima says we 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 have, that's what we should do. It's a it's a printer's mistake. What do you mean it's a printer's mistake? You know, we everybody has their own machzor for Rosh Hashanah and Kippur. We don't use uh, now now that's not true anymore. Art Scroll and Corn have both published you know a thousand pages. You know Pesach machzor, Shavuos machzor, uh, Sukkot machzor. But in the olden days, the days of the Birnbaum, you know, and the, even the original Art Scroll, the original on the original Corn sitter, everything was in one sitter. 
uh, you just flip to the back for Yontif, you know, Tfilah L'Shalosh HaRegalim. So he says, what did the printers do? Uh, the printers put in, in brackets, has my name, the time when you're supposed to fill in. If it's Pesach, it's Shavuos or Sukkot, you fill it in. Uh, of, of course you do it. Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, we had our machzor, so we didn't have to fill it in. The printer could put it in. But really, you should say, you, you, the bracha shouldn't end Mekadish Yisrael, but my name is in Mekadish Yisrael, the Chag HaMatzot, you know, or, or, you know, you know, or, or the Chag HaSukot. You should mention the actual holiday. So that was his uh, little uh, cute vort. He has that a few other times, Migdol and Magdiel's a printing error. He, he was into that a little bit. Rav Salavetia gave a whole sheer explaining why he's wrong that uh, this is incorrect, that there is a difference between the Kedusha of Yontif and the Kedusha of Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. There's a similar, Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur are different days. It's a whole, the whole um, um, mood of the day is totally different. And the halachas of the day are, are different. It's only, um, it's only if, um, um, what's I'm saying? It's the, it's the, um, the day only on the Shalash Regalim do we have to go to um, to Yerushalayim? Just give me half a second. Somebody just emailing me. They're having problems getting in because I know we changed the passcode. So I just, I saw the flash again. So I just want to let them in. I apologize for that. Okay, thank you very much. So anyway, so that, that's just one point. Okay, but anyways, it is interesting that the Torah community called to Siddur Baruch Shemar because Baruch Shemar, as we mentioned, this is the opening of Tefillah. We're finally getting Tefillah, we're praising. So last week we mentioned Baruch Osev Rashid and Baruch Omer The order is a little bit strange. God uh, cre created the world and then he said, Omer Vosah. He didn't, he said it first, Baruch, it should be Baruch Omer Vosah. God says, and then the world was created. That's Sir Mamarat, the world was created. So we explained that it was ABA, -A, you know, it's a triastic structure, Baruch Shemar Vayalam, God said, and the world was created. Baruch Oseh, in other words, we say the, he said, and he did, he did, and he said. It's just repeating the same theme because we, we discussed that, um, we discussed that how Tfilah needs, you know, chizuk, it's one of four things that we have to strengthen ourselves. And as Rashi explains, chizuk means to do it over and over. And that's the Rav Salavetsi explained. That's why we say Adon Olam at the beginning of Tila. We are very used to it at the end. That's how we end up in Shabbos morning. But as you know, it's printed at the beginning of every sitter. It's, it's meant to be said at the beginning and they have it for every day in the daily sitter. I don't know how many people say it. If anybody here says it, please let me know. I'll be very impressed and maybe you'll inspire me to say it. But I must admit, I do not say it every morning. But uh, so we have that uh, notion, but uh, it could also be um, that it could be very different. It could be that Baruch Omerva says not talking about the creation of the world now. That's Baruch Shemar Vayam. Baruch Omerva says talking in general. God says something and he does what he says. Big deal. So it is a big deal because uh, mo most people don't do what they say or don't always do what they say. And remember, everything we know about God is a model towards man. The, the Rambam says we can't understand anything about God. So when the Torah tells us about God, Hashem, Hashem, Rachum, Echanu, Nerech, Ephaim, right? We learn, we sing the, the Yud Gimel Midot. By the way, as an aside, I was in the States for, for Pesach. I don't know why it, it, it honestly, it bothers me isn't the right words to use, but I, I, I really don't like it. They, the Hashem Hashem Arachum Bechanun to in the States, they do it in minor key, as opposed to in Canada, we do it in major key. And it's so much more joyous. Like in the States, Hashem Hashem Arachum Bechanun Erech Abayim, we do Hashem Hashem Arachum Bechanun Erech Abayim, Rav Chesed, the Emet, no, it's Rav Chesed, I apologize for that. I just find the uh, tune is so much more uplifting in Canada than I think what they do in Israel and the, the United States. Okay, a little plug for our Canadian mean hugging. But um, anyways, we, we, we say the 13 principles of God, not to tell us who God is. I mean, a, a little bit, but it's really to tell us how man, the same way God is merciful. So Baruch, so we say God, God keeps his word. That is a big deal. Um, and if that, um, and we don't always keep our word. Now, the true mother, God doesn't always keep his word either. We have an idea that, um, that if God says, God gives us a negative prophecy, we can undo that, that uh, God, so God is not saying, God is warning us in a sense that, but if God says something positive, that will always happen, even if we're not worthy. That's the traditional understanding. I think, I don't know if many of you were taught that or not, that when God says something negative, it doesn't have to happen. But when God, or through the prophets, or speaking directly to Moshe, says this will happen, like the end of the Torah, he warns us, the Jews are going to leave the Torah and are going to punish them and all, 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 all the curses we read about a couple of weeks ago, they don't have to happen. 
that up to us. But if God promises, I'll take you to the land of Israel, like in the book of Yechezkel, you're an exile, but I'll take you back. That has to happen. That's what it's generally assumed. It, that doesn't seem to fit with the what Yaakov Avinu did. Um, Yaakov Avinu, when he's running away from Asaph, so he makes this, uh, you know, you know, promise: if God will be with me and I return to my home, and I go back, then I'll give you a Sarah Srenulach. I'll give you 10, 10 or twenty percent a Sarah Srenulach. So all the commentators ask, well, well, what's going on here? God just promised him. Yaakov, God appears to Yaakov and says, "I'm going to be with you." Don't worry, I'm going to be with you and I'm going to bring you home. And then Yaakov wakes up and says, oh my God, God, I, I, I can't believe I'm in the place of God. Uh, let me make a, a promise. If you bring me home, I'll, I'll be nice to you. What do you mean? God just promised he will. So the Gemara, their answers are Yaakov Avinu was afraid. Shema Yikram Hachet. God makes a promise, but if we sin, we can undo the promise. So you have there, at least according to this opinion by Yaakov Avinu, that even something positive that God says doesn't necessarily have to happen. But here in Bar Shamar, I, I don't think we're talking so much about reward and, and punishment. We're talking in general. God says something, and that's what happens, and uh, that's what we're supposed to do. If, if, and like that, it's kind of an introduction. It's an introduction to the next line, Baruch Gozer um Mikayim. God uh, makes a decree, and he keeps his decree. So I mentioned last week in Nusach Ashk in in Nusach Ashkenaz, um, what we're doing, in our the sitter I'm using, so we said Baruch Hosef Rashid and Baruch Omer Hosef, but um, we, uh, we had that 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 problem. God's creating before He's saying He's creating. But in the Nusach Svard sitter, uh, Baruch um, Omer Vo, Baruch Hosef Rashid, Omer Vo says next to Baruch Merachem, uh, Baruch Ozer Umikayim, which is what we have here. Actually, we have that in the Ashkenaz also. I apologize. Read Baruch Baruch Omer Vo said would be the, um, you, you don't have Baruch Hosef Rishit there, but you just have Baruch Omer Vosef would be the introduction or the um, notion of Baruch Gozer Umekayim. It's like a double notion. Now we, that's how we said, Baruch Shemar Vayalam, Baruch Hosef Rishit, Baruch Omer Vosef. But also Baruch Omer Vosef, Baruch Gozer Umekayim is sort of a double idea that God says and he does and goes there and he decrees and, uh, and it happens. So that's sort of, that's a harsher thing. God's making a decree and the decree happens as opposed to God saying, we know Vayomer and Vayadaber are two different forms of speaking. Vayomer is soft and pleasant and peaceful. Vayadaber is hard. Vayadaber Shem Amosha which is the more, much more common one, is a, is a harsher form of speech. It's a command. Savapaneso, I command you. Vayomer is a pleasant one. I, I engage in the, uh, in you know, in man, by Yomer Elohim, or God, God says something to us in a more pleasant idea. But okay, that's uh, so. Yeah, Baruch Hashem, Baruch Gozer Hashem, Baruch Merchem Alaretz. God has mercy on the land. That's very interesting. You know, I think very appropriate for the 21st century. That uh, the importance of the land um, and, and the preservation of Earth, which is a very you know Jewish idea. Of course, uh, and in, in, in a certain sense, it's the first thing that is created even before light, right? What did God create first? Well, on day one, he created by Heor, but the Prolohim at the Shemaim Betarets. That's a kind of a, you know, that's the, not for now really, but how do you understand the, the relationship between the first verse of the Torah and what happened is Bereshi Prolohim at the Shemaim Betarets, sort of the, the, the heading. God created heavens and earth. Now I'm going to go back and I'll tell you the six steps of the way. Uh, each day, quote unquote, he created one of the steps of Shamaim and Aretz. And he started with Thor. Or is that somehow uh, a different thing? No, Breshit, first God created the heavens and the earth. And then he added all the things to it. So whatever it means. But the, the opening verse of the Torah talks about the importance of heaven and the importance of earth. Of course, it's on day two, they get split, right? The the Mai, Mitacha, the the, the heavenly waters and the um, the lower waters. We'll come back to that in a uh, in a few minutes. And then we say Baruch Merchem El Habriot. God has mercy on creations. We know that Briot always mean um, Briot means all creations. First of all, I um, mentioned before that in 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 the Rambam, there um, like the, the term Adam. Adam means all of mankind. Bnei Yisrael means Jew. Adam Kiyak Bimikens. The book of Bereshit begins with Adam. A man and the Talmud picks up on that right away that anybody can come to, to and offer sacrifices and the Talmud has lots of laws the Mishnah discusses non-Jews bringing sacrifices we very much welcome I think it's a beautiful 
point of point of our religion. I don't have to tell you, and we don't discuss her, her, her politics, but look how other religions treat other people coming to their holy places. Look how the Muslims think about the Jews or even Christians coming to pray at the place where the Muslims want to pray. And we Jews say, Ki beiti beiti I will bring you to my mountain. I'll rejoice with you in my house of, of, of prayer. Because my house is a house of prayer for all nations. It's such a beautiful, universal idea that we have. Yes, we have individual things that are unique to Judaism, but ultimately we are very universalistic religion. And Sefer Vayikra, the central book of the Torah, the book that talks about Avodah Hashem, Torah Kohanim, how we come closer to God, the 19th chapter of Kedoshim, the most in the of Vayikra, you know, love your neighbors and stuff. The most important mitzvot are in the book of Vayikra. That's how the rabbi said, Rav Gufei Tlorim, the Rav Gufei Torah Tlorim, the majority, the essence of the Torah is in the book of Vayikra. That's why it's the middle of the five books of the Chumash. And we begin, Adam, Adam Kiyakri Mikem Korban. Anybody, the Gemara has an expression, Adam, and anybody who learns Torah, um, it's also this uh, also is you know is uh, gets tremendous reward. Adam always refers to all of humanity. But Nei Israel, that's a, we we have to wear we have to put a, a mezuzah. And non Jews don't need a mezuzah on their house. Okay, the seder. Uh, the Rambam when he refers to non Jews, always uses the expression Ba'e Olam, those who come into the world. And uh, this comes up when somebody makes a promise, what expression he used, I won't get any benefit from people. And depending on what expression he used is, does it include non-Jews or not? So the Rambam always uses the expression of uh, ba'e olam um, to refer to non-Jews. Briot has an even broader definition. Briot doesn't just refer to people, it refers to all manner of creation, plants, animals, anything that was created. Baruch Merchem we'll Briot, we're gonna come back to this in a moment, is, is more than Jew and it's more than non-Jew, it's God has mercy on the land. Baruch Merchem al Aretz, Baruch Merchem al Habriyot. So basically you see in Baruch Shemar, everything is repeated twice. The same thing, Baruch Merchem al Aretz, Baruch Merchem al Briyot, they're clearly are related. Baruch Merchem al Aretz, Baruch Merchem al Aretz, Baruch Merchem al Aretz, Baruch who, you know, Baruch Merchem al Aretz, the themes all appear to be in double, keeping with this theme, of repetition in our opening of the prayers. And then same thing, Baruch Meshalim, Sachar Tov Lireyav, God gives a uh, a good reward. What's the difference between a good reward and a bad reward? Like if you're a hockey fan, you win hockey tickets, it's a, you like hockey, it's a good reward. If you don't like hockey, it's a bad reward. What does it mean, Baruch Meshalim, Sachar Tov Lireyav? God gives a good reward to those who fear him or in awe of him. I was like, the term year, I think is better translated as uh, awe than fear. Uh, you should not be in, be afraid of your parents. You should be in awe of your parents. That's a, that's a beautiful thing to be in awe of somebody. It, says, uh, it means they're greater than us. That's what, that's what it's supposed to be, our relationship with their parents. Fear is pachad. So Rav Salabetik explains, the only time we pray for, for fear is on Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur. During a seret to make tshuva. So then it pachdecha. And then we ask God to put fear, put the fear of God in man. But that's uh, that's unusual. That's not our general motif that we like to use. It's not good. It's not good. Um, it's, um, but we generally have Yirat Hashem. Yirat Hashem is being awe, be inspired, not to be afraid of, right? And of course, uh, a husband and wife is Ahava, love. We, there's no, because the one a spouse is not supposed to be in awe of the other spouse. That is really a terrible thing when that happens. And that's how the Nitziv explained that was the problem with Yitzchak and Rivka. Rivka was in awe of Yitzchak. Wow, he was willing to die. She came from Lavan's house and she, what she saw, said, Man, this guy, he's much older than her and he was willing to be sacrificed. So he was, she was in awe. And that's how the Nitziv explains all the problems happened. She couldn't speak to him about Asaph's not such a great guy. She couldn't convince him. She didn't want to argue with him. He's such a, wow, he's otherworldly. So that's not a relationship between a husband and a wife. That's a relationship between a child and a parent, even though the parent isn't perfect, but from the child's perspective, they have to be in awe. But um, that's the, the, we explained, the Gemara says, reacha means a spouse. That's what it also, it also means everybody, but it primarily means a, um, a spouse. So different terms, ahava, uh, yira, kavod. Kavod means to, it's not respect, I mean, it is respect, but it means it's, um, it's service. 
Kaved is not does not really mean to respect a parent. Uh, it means to service a parent. When the term kavod, so it means you have to go shopping for them, you have to take them to the the doctor's appointment, whatever. That that's the halakhic obligation of kibud is not what we call respect in English. It's what we call a service obligation. So anyway, Baruch Tov God gives a good reward to those who are in awe of Him, who are inspired. Awe is meant to be inspiring. It makes sense, right? It's not the way, you know, to be afraid of somebody, eh, that, that's not what we want the reward for. That's not what we want. And uh, to be equal, God, you know, that's obviously can't apply. So, um, so uh, well, what's a sachar tov? Anybody? What's a sachar tov? What's a good reward as opposed to a bad reward? Maybe from Hashem's point of view? Well, from our, we say, Baruch Mishalem sachar tov lirayav. What do we mean by that? God gives us a good reward. People aren't always satisfied with rewards. Right. So, so meaning what? Right. So, right, you're probably a reward that I don't want. Right. So that, that's yes. God will give us a reward, even if we may not like it. He gives us what we think. God gives us the good reward, the reward that's good for us. We may not recognize it as a reward. That's very, very possible. Sachar gives a reward. And that's what I want. A Sachar means a reward that's good for you. Sometimes a reward that's good for you is what we call a punishment. You know, uh, we, we give you a challenge because you can rise to the challenge. You consider that a punishment. You know, so, I don't know, somebody goes bankrupt. So sometimes bankrupt may be actually a, a, a reward. We don't normally think that way, but um, that is what, um, that is very, very possible. Um, but anyways, so um, um, it's what we say in Rosh Chodesh Benching, Chaim Sheim Alu Mishalot Libenu Litova. God shall fill our wills. That's only good for us because we often pray. This is such a beautiful idea and so powerful. We often pray for the wrong things, right? We pray, we pray, pray. I've mentioned many times for Soloveitchik, I, you know, many times he first that when he was in Europe, he used to daven, he should never end up in America. The tray from Medina, there's no learning, there's no nothing. He would pray, he would daven to Hashem, he should never end up because there were lots of people who were immigrating to America and uh, he didn't want to go. He wanted to stay and learn in, the, in Europe. And he says, Baruch Hashem, God said no to his prayers. So sometimes we totally pray. So it's the God should answer our prayers. That's good for us. So it's probably the same thing here. Okay. Baruch God lives. Blessed is the one, right? Always the Baruch and the 10 Baruchs we spoke about last week, whatever. Baruch Chai. By, by the way, I did see this week, Rav David Tzvi Hoffman does affirm what I had said um, that um, um, what's his name? Um, El Bogan rejects that Baruch Hu was a response. Baruch Shemar Vayalam Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu Rishit Baruch Hu. Baruch Hu was the responsive reading of the Kahal. The Chazan would say Baruch Shemar Vayalam, and you would answer Blessed He. And he would say Baruch Hu Rishit, and you would say Baruch Hu. So I mentioned that last week. And I mentioned, I saw that in Elbogen, the German scholar who wrote on the history of the Jewish liturgy, who brings up that suggestion and he rejects it. But I saw this week, Rav David Svi Hoffman, the great German uh, uh, leader of orthodoxy at the turn of the 20th century. He was the rector of the, after Azriel Hildesheimer. He was the, the third rector of the, Hilde, of the Hildesheimer. He was the greatest post in Germany at the turn of the century. I don't know if anybody's read his response to the Malamid Lahoel, very appropriate. I, I have said many, many times, we are heirs to German Orthodoxy, not to Eastern European Orthodoxy. Mm -hmm. Most of us are, are descendants of people, who, I think, I think most people here, please correct me if I'm wrong, um, but most people here, I think, are descendants of Jews who lived in Eastern Europe, but we, we are descendants um, ideologically and religiously from Jews who lived in, in Germany. In other words, the issues of uh, the modern world and intermarriage and Jews who aren't so religious and that uh, is much more of a German thing. So you're reading the chubas of the German great post scheme, the Sri De Eish and the Malamed Lahoel and the Rav Israel Hildesheimer, even, you know, Shim from Rafael Hirsch, although not so much Halachi responded, that very much speaks to us because they're dealing with the same issues we are dealing with. So, Rabbi David Tzvi Hoffman, who was the leader of the Hildesheimer Rabbinic Summer, was like, quote unquote, the Yeshiva University of, uh, of, of, of 
Berlin, every uh, German Orthodox rabbi was was trained pretty much. Shimshon Rav Hirsch did not believe in not believe he wasn't into rabbis. Shimshon Rav Hirsch was into having great balabatim. It's a fascinating idea. It's very unusual. Most great people want to build up great rabbis. No, Shimshon Rav Hirsch wanted to build up great balabatim. Learned to heal him. He had very little gemara in his school. He didn't believe most people should learn so much gemara. Just he to heal him. Chumash. Uh, philosophy, Machshav, and look, look what he, he wrote about. Look what Hirsch's, you know, writings were about. So Hirsch was very much about building up community in Balabatim. And uh, that was in Frankfurt. And uh, Rav David C. Hoffman, really, as real Hildesheimer, who started the Hildesheimer, what we call the Hildesheimer Rabbinic Seminary in 1873, I believe, when he began it, that to train rabbis and all the German rabbis, as Berkeley, anybody you know from, from Germany, I mean, now they're not, basically nobody left, but, uh, you know, growing up, there were a lot of these people, um, they were all trained in the whole summer rabbinic seminary. So Rav David C. Hoffman was the rector, as they called it, of the seminary. And I said, already you can hear how modern it is. And um, he dies in 1921, but he wrote a fascinating He was also the first great rabbi to deal with the issue of biblical criticism. You know, I'm not sure if people are aware of this. Tell me if you know all this stuff. But uh, Rav David C. Hoffman wrote in German, of course. It has, as far as I know, it has never been translated into English. It has been translated into Hebrew for when I said, but never into English. He wrote a two-volume critique of Wellhausen, of the of the issues of biblical criticism. He was the first great rabbi to face them head on and to deal with them. And to, you know, the Bible critics are not stupid people. They have, uh, the, you know, we, let's deal with their arguments and let's see how we can respond. Anyways, I just, as an aside back here, from David C. Hoffman, so he has, he does accept this explanation. He explained the Baruch Hu was a refrain so Baruch Hamersa, and, we, and everybody would answer. It makes a, a lot of sense. It, it really, to me, it sounds right. Do I know if that's what, you know how often that was done historically? I can't, I, I can't tell you. But of course, that works much more in a Sephardic setting, uh, the way the Sephardic, the way we Ashkenazi would happen. Okay, Baruch Hailat Dekayim Lanetzah. God lives forever. Again, Chai La'ad and Chayam Lanetzah is really saying the same thing twice. He's Chai uh, La'ad, he lives uh, for all or ever. And here, I'll read the English. Uh, Blessed is he who lives forever and exists to eternity. Okay, very similar idea. We'll get to um, that in a moment, some more explanation. Baruch Podeh Umatzil. Baruch, again, Podeh Umatzil is very similar. What's the difference between Pidya and Hatzalah? So some want to say one is spiritual and one is physical. Okay, it could very well be. But uh, conceptually, there are similar ideas. Baruch Podeh, he redeems us and he saves us. Okay, when you redeem somebody, you save them, hopefully. Baruch Shmo, and blessed is God's name. And that's how we end. And of course, Baruch Hu U Baruch Shemo, right? You hear that refrain. That is our refrain. That's our refrain to every bracha. So we begin, Baruch Shemar is the introduction, Baruch Shemar, Baruch Hu. And then we end, Baruch Shemo, Baruch Hu U Baruch Shemo. Blessed is he and blessed is his name. And of course, that's the pretty much the mission of the Jew. The mission of the Jew is to make God's name great in this world. That's Vayikra uh, B'Shem Hashem. We say it 5,000 times in Rosh Hashanah Davning. Um, Abraham Avinu did it all the time. He would call out on God's name. And Yitzchak did it. Yaakov did it. That's the mission of Jew, to call out God's name. That's why Noah's son is shame. We are descendants of shame, right? Believe me, that wasn't his name. We've discussed a number of times. The names in the Bible, most of them are, I assume, are made up made up the biblical uh, god like there it's a reference to there I, I i find it very hard to believe that noah named his son shame i also find it hard to believe he named his son cham and yafet right the rabbis make big deals about it. cham heat passion yeah, that's very very negative yafet beauty grease the gemara says the oil of shame shame exists in yafet yafet is beauty represents grief i i it's i find it i i can't believe noah named his son i don't know if noah spoke hebrew I know, so uh, that's uh, the, the Torah's use of names always. We discussed last week, numbers are rounded off. That's why I, I think, I don't know, if maybe I discussed it on a Shir or in Shavuos. I didn't discuss it here, I don't know, but whatever. Uh, we round off numbers. The, the, the Torah plays with these things to make ideas. So shame, Noah's great son, the one who produced 10 generations later, Abraham, Avraham is, is shame because that's the mission of the Jew to call out on God's name. That's what we call a kiddush Hashem and a Hashem. A to, to destroy God's name is the one sin you can't 
do any tshuva for. Yom Kippur doesn't help, as the Rambam writes. So Kiddush Hashem is the greatest mitzvah. So Baruch Shemo, that's sort of the mission of the Jewish people is to bring glory to God's name. So say we say, Vahapta Hashem El- the Gemara interprets that doesn't mean we shall love it means we shall make others love of course you can only make others love I mean probably effectively if you yourself also love it means we have to love God but more important than we loving God we have to help other people to love God yeah, I think was how you would, would read it and you shall cause others to love God so that's Baruch Hu Baruch Shemo that's the uh, Begin now. Just let me just sort of to summarize some of this and point out maybe a few additional points. So basically, what does Baruch Shamar do? Baruch Shamar proclaims the essence of God. That's uh, the Rav David Hoffman, who I was mentioning before, it discusses this sort of a great length. The Shem Havaya. It's 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 God's name. Baruch Shamar is reflecting God's name. What's the name? A name is the essence of who a person is. The Torah does put great emphasis on names. Names are very important. We know we, we don't like to be called he, she, but we like to be called by our name. People, you know, they do all these psychological experiments. You're in a very noisy room, can't hear one word. At the end of the other room, somebody mentions your name, your ear picks it up. So we're, we're very tied and connected to our name. So uh, our Bershomar our, is an expression of God's name, the Shem Havaya, the, the name of God we can't pronounce that, uh, the, you know, um, that's when, what, what is, so who is God? Basically, God is a creator who fulfills his promises, who's merciful, who gives reward, who's eternal, a redeemer, and therefore he's blessed. That, that's basically what we're saying in Baruch Shemar. So let's just, uh, you think, so creator is obvious, Baruch Shemar Yalam, that's what it's all about, fulfills his promises. Of course, that's Omer Vosteh, Gozer Umekayim. That's, um, he says, he does what he says, and he decrees and it happens. God is, is merciful, mercy on all the creation, even on the land itself. Um, as a matter of fact, okay, I will come back to that in a second. Um, God gives reward and punishment, he's an e- eternal, a redeemer, and we bless him. And of course, like we started, everything we know about God is for man. So if God is all of this, that means we have to be all of this. So uh, we have to create, Rav Salavechik would often explain, that's the first mitzvah of the Torah, for a Jew to be a creator. And therefore the first actual mitzvah of the Torah is to have, have children. But Rav Salavechik explains in a much broader light, every Jew, every person, I would say, has to find their creative talents and, and develop their creative talents. Some people are good at math, some people are good in science, some people are good in art, some people are good in, uh, in athletics even. You know, everybody has a creative talent and it's really sad when somebody's in their wrong field, when they're not in the area where they're creative. The Gemara expresses that in terms of, um, of learning. The Gemara says, God cries three tears every day. Have people heard that Gemara? Gemara and Avodah anybody know? Gemara says, God cries three tears every day. Obviously it's not literal. What are the three tears that God cries? Anybody? So tier number one is for people who are not cut out for learning and learn. They, they shouldn't be teachers of Torah. They're, they're, they're teaching. They go into teaching. They're not good teachers. They, they, they don't have the personality. Even if they have tremendous knowledge, yeah, I, I don't have to explain. I think everybody understands that. That's one tier. The second tier, which is really a result of the first tier, is those who should be teaching and are not. That's a, maybe a tragic comment on our generation. People are very talented. We make wonderful teachers, but they can't feel they can't earn, earn a living or whatever it is. So God cries for those who could have been teaching Torah, but are not teaching Torah. In other words, if you're in the wrong field, that's what makes God cry. And uh, at the Gemara, of course, expresses it in the term of, um, of, of learning, but it applies to philosophy and science and the engineering. It applies to everything. So the person has to find uh, the God is a creator, man has to be a creator. By the way, what is the, the third tier God cries? So the third tier is people who go into public life for personal glory. I don't know anybody like that. I never met such a person. Somebody who is a, a parnes al hatzibur, shalom l'shem shemaim. He, he, he lords over the community, but not for the sake of heaven. We discussed many times, Moshe Oskim Bitzar Chetzibur Be'emunah. Right, because when you go into public service, you have to hurt people. That's the definition of public service. I'm going to give more money to education, Alex, to healthcare. So yeah, you, ha- you have to hurt people. That's what it means to serve public life. Yeah, get rid of people. Yeah, 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 that's what it means. 
Of course, if you're doing it because you're helping more people than you hurt, that's wonderful. But if you're doing it for personal glory, then you got to pay the price for all the people you hurt for your personal glory. It's a very scary thought. But anyways, that's the third tier of God. So man has to be a, a creator. Of course, we have to fulfill our word, uh, right? The, the first sin of man is how they spoke, right? Chava misspoke to the, uh, to the snake and said, uh, God told me not to touch the tree. That wasn't true. Don't say more than you have to say. God said, don't eat it. He didn't say, don't touch it. You can touch it. Uh, you can't extend it. To make a rabbinic prohibition into a biblical prohibition is baltosi. The Rambam writes, if a person were to claim that uh, whatever whatever rabbinic prohibition is the same as uh, meat and milk, that's a violation. Even if you don't do anything, you just say it. That's a violation of adding to the Torah. You're not, you can't say more than what it is so so um uh, yeah one can't be a teacher without being in the classroom of course we can all be teachers yeah yeah the problem is one who's learning to her you know what the, he's not yeah um um a hundred percent so um speech we misspeak of course we can't say more and then of course when god confronted adam oh it's my wife's fault right and the Lord says uh the wife who you gave me right yeah like the ashtach of god uh god it's your fault if you wanted to create, I didn't ask you to create Eve. You you decided to put me to sleep and take my rib cage and create her. I, I didn't ask you to do that. Aisha Shernatata Imadi, you did it. Rashi Mishan Kafui Bitara. Man showed his ingratitude, blaming God. God did it Latova. God gave Lotova Yatodam Levado. God gave him a Sahar Tov, the greatest Sahar Tov to have a life's partner. No greater reward than, than that. And a man took it as, you know, it's her fault. So, of course, how we speak, that's, of course, how we have to imitate. We are merciful. God is merciful. We have to be merciful. We'll discuss in a moment. So how, how well, if God is eternal, so how, how are we eternal? Well, wait, I mean, that's, that's where I can be merciful. I can be a creator. I can fill my words. I can maybe even be a redeemer in a certain sense. I can help people. Yeah, save people. But how in the world can a human being be eternal? Isn't that the gulf between man and God? Through our children? So that's one approach, through our children. Very good. But not everybody manages to have children. That's what we started before. Baruch Shemar, right? Tov mi banim mi banot. I mentioned, you know, some of the greatest, greatest leaders, of rabbis of the 20th century did not have children. The Lubavitcher Rebbe and the Chazonish and the Chamalibowitz and, uh, the, and the Sri Deish. The list is uh, a pretty scary list of amazing Torah scholars who did not have children. Sheryl Lieberman, if you, you know, uh, all these people who did not have any children. The Satmar Rebbe had, but died in the, you know, before they got married, uh, whatever. So uh, not everybody, the people don't get married, people, all kinds of reasons people don't have, have, have children. And that's what the prophet is saying. I'll give you a greater reward than even children. Told me, bani, umi banot, right? So, that's, and what do they have to do? Shimru, Shabdotai, what, what has the pastor continue? I don't have it in front of me. Whatever it is, you have to, to teach Torah there, keep Shabbos, keep the mitzvot. We are eternal through, like you say, everybody can be a teacher and you don't have to be in the classroom. The, by being a link in the chain of, of Torah, even, you know, a link even without through children, just being part of that Torah, connecting to Torah, that's what makes us eternal. The Gemara is a beautiful um, um, idea. The Gemara, I think it's in Yavama Sirksuva. If it's in Yavama, we're coming to it in Daf Yomi in a day or two. Now, I forget already. The Daf, and Daf I think, Sadi Kayam would bait. I just forget if it's in Yavama Sirksuva. That the Gemara says that when you quote a person, you quote what somebody says, Lam Svatav Dovavot Bekever, the person's lips move in the grave. You quote a deceased person. And what you call it, they say their lips are moving. It's, of course, it's a, it's a beautiful notion. That's how we keep people alive, by, by discussing their legacy. That's what Yisker is all about. We say Yisker and, and Yontif, right? To, to remind yourself, it, it's, a very, it's a very difficult custom to say Yisker and Yontif. You're, you're not allowed to induce sadness, right? The Gemara says you're not allowed to give a husband. We, we don't follow this. Maybe our spade aren't like that. The Gemara says you're not allowed to give a eulogy 30 days before Yontif. You'll be all depressed. I don't you know anybody got depressed for 30 days. They went to some rabbi's funeral, some their cousin's funeral or something. And for, for 30 days, because of the person who gave a, the eulogy was so powerful that for 30 days, they couldn't go on. And therefore the Gemara says, you're not allowed to have a, a eulogy 30 days before any yontem because it's going to ruin the simch of the yontem. Amazing. 
even right so um so um how do you say yisker so yisker it's, that's why it is a difficult custom but it is our custom at least the Ashkenazim. but it's yisker on on yontem is meant to inspire it's not meant to induce any any sadness it's meant we wow look at what we can learn from our our, our parents it's, it's really meant as inspiration so yes we can be eternal through torah by linking our life to torah even without children um, we can have and of course the mission as i said is to make god's name great okay I want to go through this. I hope this works. Um, but I read, I saw last night, I was like, whoa, this is amazing. The Abu Draham, Abu Draham was the 14th century, I think 14th century Spanish, uh, you know, Spanish scholar who wrote uh, one of the first commentaries on, on the Siddur, two volume work, the Abu Draham, Rav uh, David Yosef, I think, David Abu Draham. He's the one, by the way, who gives the explanation that. Uh, very questionable if it's true that the reason women are exempt from mitzvot asayshas mangrama, that women are exempt from time-bound positive mitzvot, is because uh, they're too busy raising their kids. That's the famous explanation that I imagine many of you were taught. It's a very problematic explanation. Not, not, not problematic philosophically, it's problematic in just not true. I, a woman, how many years does a woman spend raising her, her children? 20 years, she has eight kids, okay? How many years? Like one of the children, like the first 20 years of her life, she's not raising any children. So from the age of 20 to 45, she's raising children, maybe. But 45, how, how by 45, her youngest is uh, three. I mean, you know, uh, for most it's not, but you know, even if, uh, so uh, the, the whole thing doesn't make any sense. But because of 20 years of her life, so she's, so for those 20 years, she should be exempt. The more fundamental problem, I guess, for us modern people, as Rev Lichten said, said, where does it doesn't say anywhere that it's the the mother's obligation to raise kids. If anything, this the father has to be more busy with kids. The the father has to it's the father's obligation to teach a child Torah. So maybe he's teaching child Torah he has no time to do the mitzvot. Uh, so it's not uh, it's not written anywhere that it's a woman obligation. It's look in the Torah during the father. So, but anyways, that's the Abu Draham's probably, you know, because in Spain in the 14th century, that was probably very true. Probably that's that's how life lived. So, okay, so every generation has to find their own reason and their own rationale. We don't really know why women are exempt from mitzvah, but that's the Abu Durham's uh, famous uh, reason that I think has become quoted often. So let's see, I want to quickly go through what he says. So he wants to say, we mentioned last week, that God created the world in 10 sayings. So he wants to link the saying of Baruch Shamar to the actual sayings of God in the creation of the world. So let's some, I think some of them are very good. Some of them may be a little bit of a, a, um, a stretch, but let's take a look. So he begins for Bereshit um, Elohim, um, Baruch Hosev, Bereshit, Bereshit Elohim. Okay, that's obvious. Okay, then we go to what do we say? Baruch Omer Vosev. So he says, Baruch Omer Vosev, is Vayomer Elohim Yehi Or. That's the first time God says, and there was. Vayomer Reshi for Elohim at the Shemaim Bethars. God didn't say anything. The Gemara says, he, but he didn't say anything. So uh, Baruch Omerva said, that's Vayhi Or. Baruch goes there, Umikayim. That's the separation of the water. By Yehi Raki, Vayhi Mabdil, like you make a decree. No, no, this isn't working. I got to separate the earth from the heaven. Baruch Merachem al Aretz. What's Baruch Merachem al Aretz? Is God separating the oceans from the land? The, right. The, remember, God says, um, "What does God say?" Um, that the waters go to one place. In other words, there was water the entire earth. Now, what? What is it? Seventy-five percent of the earth is water. So then it was a hundred percent. So Baruch Merachem al Aretz. The only way we had God's mercy on the land. Was Vayomer Elohim Yikavu Amayim? Let the waters um, recede so the Yabasha can exist. Then in Baruch Merachem Al Habriot, God has mercy on all creation. We said Briot is animal kingdom, so that's the God. That's the creating of Tatshei Haaretz. Vayomer Elohim Tatshei Haaretz Deshlek Rasgro, because that's what animals eat, so they can the cattle can graze. So Baruch Merachem Al Habriot is the next Vayomer that after God made the waters recede, He made the land grow. Now, here's very interesting. We, the Girsa, the, the one we have, we what have we have Baruch Mishalem's Kartobirev. So he was using the um, the original edition, if I can use that term, of Baruch Shamar that came from Rab, um, the Siddur of Amram Gon. That's pretty much the first Siddur we have. 
um, Rav Amram Gaon, uh, 8th century, I believe, one of the Gaonim, the Babylonian leaders of the Yeshivot. So he printed, a, a, a printed. there was no printing. He wrote up a, a letter to Spain, whatever, with how to, they should get daven. So his version of Baruch Shemar now is a little bit different. The next line is Baruch Ma'avir Afela. God re removes the darkness. We bless God. It's continuation. Now we know in the Chumash, day one and day four, day two and day five, day three and six go together. In day one, God created light. In day six, he created the sun. I mean, in, in day four, it's a little funny. We don't have time to develop that whole relationship, right? Day one goes with day four, by he or then day four is the creation of the sun. So that's Ma'avir Afela. God removes the darkness from the world. That's God creating this, the sun. Day two and five, right? Day two is God separates between the upper and the lower worlds, right? And day five is the birds and the animals, right? The upper and the lower. And day six, God, day three, God creates the land. And, uh, and day six is God creates the mammals and humans who walk on the land. So there's a, the parallelism between one and four, two and five, three and six. One and four is sort of the original creation, what we call, what Leon Cass calls the um, ecstatic creation. There are things that don't move. Um, and day four, five and six are the movement. Right. Even the, you, know, you want to say the sun doesn't move from perspective of us, it does move, but the moon for sure moves, the moon and the star, you know, that doesn't move. But every and day, and of course, the land and the animals and humans who live on it. So, anyways, that's the connection. But he says, so, Ma'avira um, Fela, those are the luminaries in the sky. Baruch Notein Sachar Tov, God gives a good reward. So, this is very interesting. He says that is a reference to the Taninim. That um, the uh, whatever we call them, sea monsters, is that what we call the Tanim? Some say dinosaurs, who knows what it is. And he quotes the famous, I think the relatively famous Midrash, that uh, God, uh, the Tanim would have destroyed the whole world. It's such big animals. So God, God slaughtered the female animals so they can't have any kids. And then he salted it, and that's the, the Leviathan, that's the meat that. Uh, or whatever, maybe it's vegetarian, I don't know, that we're going to eat and uh, that the, the righteous people are going to eat in the world to come. So Baruch Mishalim Sachar Tov the Rayab is the creation of the, the, uh, of the, of the Taninim Hagdolim. And then the next Baruch Shamar is um, um, eh, that in Rav Amram's, that the Abu Raham is working on, is Baruch She'ein Lepanav, God has no Avla, has no uh, mistakes, no shichacha, he doesn't forget. Maso panim, he doesn't show any favoritism. Mekach shochet, um, and he doesn't take any any bribe. So we don't have that in our Mar Shamar. It's actually quite a beautiful thing. And that's basically psukim um, in in the Chumash, right? That God is aim go shicha, no avla shichacha, maso panim, or mekach shochet. So he says, avla, mistake, so that's God, now we're into day six, we're moving on the Bayomers, and he says that God created the animals liminehu, that, uh, that each animal should um, cohabit and coexist with its um, own. That's what he says, otherwise it would be an avla. Okay, I'm a sopanim, this is very fascinating. You can uh, think, what, tell me what, you, you, you know, you don't have to accept everything, but masopanim, um, no favoritism. So he says, not only animals, that's why eights pre ose preliminehu, even the trees. You're not allowed to graft like two different uh, fruit to make, you know, uh, other, um, a third fruit. So the, and the, God doesn't show any favoritism between the animal kingdom and the, the vegetative kingdom. Okay. That's, of course, is let us make man. How does God live forever through man? This is a very powerful idea. We're man's, we're man's partners in creation. Um, God needs us. This is sort of a, a, the little, and I know nothing about Kabbalah, but this sort of this Kabbalistic notion that God needs man, right? Right. Rashi quotes it by Hebrew Shurin Melech Mitasek Roshayam in the Zod Habracha. When we, we crown the king, we crown God, Mitasek Roshayam. When the Jewish people come together, we can crown God. If the Jewish people don't come together, if we're fighting, we can't crown God. God is divided if we're divided. So, in other words, God can only be a king based on the rule of how Jewish people act. It's a very heretical idea, in, of course, but it's a, it's a very beautiful idea. 
at the, the same time, God, we're God's partners. God created an incomplete world. And in a certain sense, God needs us as much as we need him. Uh, so that's what he says. God, God, that's not sad. God turned to the angels as Rashi interprets and let us make man. That's sad. So that's and man who perpetuates God's kingdom. God, man who brings God's Torah to the world and morality and ethics. That's how we have God to live forever. So I think it's a very powerful, beautiful idea. And then the actual bracha um, is um, that he says the tenth is now the bracha that we haven't even began yet. The baruch shemar vayalam baruch baruch hashem That's an introduction to baruch shemar, right? Baruch hashem on kenu echlam ha'el ha'av rachamanu mulav v'yamo. God is uh, our God, our Father, the one who has mercy on us, the one who's praised by His nation. So he says that is the mitzvah approval. Like kind of like that's our mission in life is to praise God. That's how uh, that's how the Abu Draham says. Oh, yeah, I, I just found it very fascinating that the because Basara Mamarot Nivraulam, and that's what we said last week, that Baruch Shamar is you know paralleling. We're saying Baruch Shamar, thank you God for creating the world. So he's going actually the actual phrases that we say in Baruch Shamar um, very much do tie into the actual Baruch um, Bayomer Elohim that we have in the um, first chapter in Bereshit des describing the, the creation of the world. Okay, so let's quickly, I've uh, got a few minutes left, um, do the, um, the bracha itself. Uh, that's what he said. God is an Avan Arachaman, right? So God is, we know this, Avinum Avkenum. God is our father and God is our king. And we know those are contradictory elements, just like uh, Ahava and Yira, right? To be in love and to be in awe, we said that husband and wife have to love each other. They can't be in awe of each other, that they, they, they contradict each other. Only by God, it's very, right? For only by God, we have this contradictory relationship. We have to love God, after the Shem, and we have to Shem we also be in awe of God. That's a unique idea. By humans, we can't have that. Same thing in Kavod and Ahava. Service is a hierarchy. Love is an equality. That's what we've said many times. That's why the mitzvah is to, to Kavod, to, to honor, to, to service, really. Kavod, to service our parents and not to love our parents because love indicates equality and the Torah doesn't want to have that. Parents and children are not equal. Kavod is a, a higher, hierarchical relationship and therefore the child has to have Kavod and Yira towards the parents. We have to have ahava to other people and ahava to our spouse and only and to uh, um, a convert. We have to have a special mitzvah to love the convert and the stranger. Um, only with God, we have this dual contradictory relationship of God. Right? We have two verses that contradict each other. We've got to find the katuba shlishit, the resolution. Do we relate to our God as our father or do we relate to our God as our, our king? Do we, do we relate to God from Ahava or do we relate to God through Yira? So of course we have to do both. Obviously that's what the Torah is saying. They can be much, you see, both are true, but uh, you know, they can't, not necessarily at the same time. We've mentioned other times that the Ramban writes, ultimately Ahava is greater than Yira. Love is greater than awe, and therefore mitzvah asay doche lotase. The ahava is reflected by the positive commandments. The yira is reflected by negative commandments. Don't do this, right? Ahava, you know, love, I will do this. And when we have a conflict between a positive and a negative mitzvah, the positive mitzvah wins out. Asay doche lotase, because ahava is a greater um, power greater than Yira. That's how uh, the Ramban explained. But anyways, in Baruch Shamar, we refer to God as El Ha'avarachaman. We do not really refer, we later on, and that's what the commentators point out, we says, God, we will crown you as our king. And in essence, what that's what Baruch Shamar, that's what our entire doubling is. Baruch Shamar is the introduction. It's the praise part, but it's introduction to the entire davening. What's what do we have to do? We have to be mekabel on makut shaman. We have to accept the yoke of heaven. The mamlichacha naskir shimcha. We will mention your name in, in praise, right? The mamlichacha makenu einu. We'll um, we'll make you our king. That's that's what we do in the shema. Shema Yisrael Hashem Alkenu. We have, but um, God is our king. So we begin. We begin with um, the El Ha'avarachaman. And therefore we pray. It's very hard to praise someone you're afraid of, right? Praising, right? That's what we're talking. 
we, um, Mishubach, Mefuar, he, he's praiseworthy and uh, glorified, and those who service him and uh, the pious ones, Ubishire David Avdecha, that's going to be our model. But um, pra praising is, is a sign of love. We, it's very hard to praise when you're in sort of fear or awe. For sure, in Pachad, you can't praise. So it's different, you know, the modalities have to do with what our, our relationship is. And of course, we say, Bishire um, David Avdecha. We're going to praise you with the songs of David HaMelech. Of course, Pesukit Zimra is primarily Tehillim. There are, of course, as we know, other parts got added that aren't Tehillim. But really, really, Pesukit Zimra is, is Ashrei and the five hallelujahs. That's Pesukit Zimra. The other stuff is less important. I mean, all of Pesukit Zimra, we said, is an act of piety. But it's the Shirei David of, of Decha with the songs of David. Tehillim, and of course, Rav Soloveitchik often said that uh, that's only why we're allowed to pray. We mentioned Rav Soloveitchik was a very, you know, small C conservative uh, thinker when it came to all aspects of ritual and prayer. He didn't, uh, we shouldn't, we can't add things, we can't add keynote on Tisha B'Av, we, we can't add Halal on Yom Atzmu, do you want to say at the end? We, we was very we need only prophets. The Anshik Nesad Gdol, where it said, Ubehem come in the beam, 120 people with some prophets. They did the Shmon Esri. Rav Soloveitchik says, that's why the Gemara says they were prophets in the Chagai Zechariah Malachi, we're part of the Anshik Nesad Gdola, because without prophets, they couldn't have composed the Shmon Esri. It takes prophecy to do that. That's Rav. Uh, generally, his students, we don't follow that. We do add, you know, but the Rav is very much into this idea. We need how dare man pray? How can we pray? Who are we? We've discussed this idea. And therefore, we need what he calls a matter. We need permission. We need to have models. That's why. So in the Torah, Moshe Rabbeinu said, El, uh, El Hagadol Hagibor. That's a pasuk in the Chumash. Okay. So we we can say it. That's the Abud Raham. That's what he does. He goes through all the phrases in the certain and it shows you where they appear in Tanakh. Okay. If you're in Tanakh, I'm not doing anything. I'm just uh, paraphrasing that God gave that. Uh, our, our sanctity. So that's where Rav Soloveitchik says we can only say Shirot because how we how can we ever praise God enough? It's an insult to call a billionaire a millionaire. So how can we praise God? It's never going to be praised en enough. So no, if David Amalek did it, we can do it. So that's how Rav Soloveitchik explains Shirei David Abdacha. It's not just a statement that we're going to praise God through the songs of the great glorious singer of the Jewish people, the great poet of the Jewish people, David Hamelach, but it's what gives us permission to praise God. So that's okay. But but so you have here with the the, the brach of Rosh Hashemar, you have God as our father, a merciful father who we sing and we praise. And then we have God who we're going to crown us, the, the Melech. God is our king. Yachid Cheol Amin. Okay. All right. We can um, stop here. Just a quick review. And we'll find it next week and then uh, we continue. Okay. So we uh, just do a, a quick review. We discussed the view, uh, the view, how the Torah Tamima called this book Baruch Shamar, a reference to his name. And that's how we sort of gain e eternity. Shame Olam Eitein Lo. Okay, right? I'll give him a great name. That's people who can't have children. So that's through connection to Torah, as we described. But the Gemara says that's a reference to the book of Daniel, when you write a book and it's called by your name, that's how you have permanence. So he called his commentary on the Siddur Baruch Shemar, a fascinating person, Zmanim, you know, which, uh, that uh, printing mistakes, he has things like that all over the place. Okay, then we just went through basically the uh, various praises in Baruch Shemar, and basically it's a description of God's role and therefore man's role. God is a, a, a creator, merciful one, one who keeps his word, who's eternal, and these are all messages, of course, for 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 man and the idea that God's relationship to the God has a relationship with the land, God has a relationship with the vegetation, God has a relationship with human beings, with Jews and non-Jews. All this is encompassed in Baruch Shamar. Merachem al Habriot. God is concerned, right? He he lets the way that animals have food. So it's the the totality of creation that is God is concerned with, and therefore the totality of creation. The day where everybody will recognize the one God in the world who is that. And of course, this is our, our, our mandate to be like God. It's a very uh, bold mandate, a very beautiful idea that we're godly, but that's because we're created in the image of God. Then we went through how each one of the Baruch Shamars um, is a reference to one of the verses in the Chumash and how 
the the theme of that baruch blessed God relates to the theme of the 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 Torah Merachem al Haaretz because God allows uh, you know the the land to be created the water to recede and then He creates grass so the animals can eat and so on and so on and then the bracha itself of Baruch Shemur after the introductory repraises we uh, we say blessed we make a long bracha we normally say bracha Tashem Kema Chalam but here we had a El Ava Rachaman Hamuhulal B'Fiamo whose nation praises Him. Mishubach and Mufuar, Bolshon Chashidav. Again, it's very repetitive, as we said. This whole notion is on purpose. It's meant to be repetitive, right? It's not the same, exactly the same. Bishire David Abdecha, we're going to use the praises of David Amelech to allow us to pray, to copy him. Nalelcha, Bishvacho, Bizimroat, Negadelcha, Neshabecha, and there we're going to praise you. Again, we're going to make you big and we're going to honor you, we're going to make your name great, and then Naskir Shimcha, we're going to mention your name. That's our mission at Kiddush Hashem, shame, we're descendants of shame, to make God's name great, by Yikra Hashem Hashem, and then Melech Mulah and God is praised is through um, our praises. Okay, and then next week we can pick up on the Amsukit um, Yizirma itself. Okay, it's just, uh, thank you very much. Let me see if there are any comments that I missed. Okay, is that like saying vimru amen? I'm not sure what you mean. Is what like saying vimru amen? Yeah, vimru amen. I don't know exactly what you're referring to in the question, but the chazan is supposed to say that he shouldn't stop at the imru. He invites, right? Maybe the baruch hu, and maybe that's what you're referring to. Correct. The chazan says something uh, here. The chazan doesn't say baruch hu. He says baruch shemar. We say baruch hu. Baruch merchem al We say baruch hu. In vimru amen. The chazan says, let us all say amen together. So the chazan says, vimru amen, and then you answer amen. That's a lot of shuls. They don't do it that way. Uh, so it's really supposed to be, vimru amen, amen. And the, the chazan should really say, let us say amen, and then we should respond. It's not ideal the way often our tune works that we do the amen with the chazan. No, no, that should be the worst thing we do. Yeah, at the end of Shimon Esri, okay. Um, we remain right. That's that. Okay. Another way we influence by the German Catholic Church, your base Yaakov education. Absolutely. Uh, as I'm, I'm actually hopefully that um, um, Naomi Naomi Seidman, who gave that fascinating four part series. I don't know if he, when we started Zoom back in May, April, May, right after Pesach of 2020. Um, Naomi Seidman, who wrote the book that was published by Corin last year, two years ago, on Beis Yaakov, the founding of Beis Yaakov. She's now a, actually a professor at the University of Toronto, went to Beis Yaakov, a board park. She herself went to Beis Yaakov, comes from a, a very uh, family, very much in that world. And uh, she wrote the book on the development of Beis Yaakov, so you can listen to her four-part series. So absolutely, she went out as a uh, People think Sarah Schneer comes from a sort of more Haredi ish, uh, whatever you want to call it. Sarah Schneer was great. The base Yaakov is, is basically German Orthodoxy translated in, in, in the Poland. It's not true that Sarah Schneer was the first one to say women should learn. That was already, it wasn't even like, like Shinshmer Paul Hirsch, it was Chacham Bernays who, who preceded him. The, uh, the, that's, um, that's, um, Hirsch was following on a German tradition that women get a serious education. But we, we forget about that kind of, you know, uh, I, I know people, I remember growing up, uh, Zeb, um, what they used to have in an open eye, I forget, the Wiles. He'll, he'll, um, she went to, um, she went to Shimshon Rafael Hirsch's school in, in Frankfurt. I, I mean, Shimshon Rafael Hirsch wasn't living, but his school in the 20s and the 30s in Germany, he went to that school, co-ed school, but men and women in the same school building in different classes. That's she told me. That's how Hirsch set up the school. They weren't in the same class, but they were in the same building. Um, that's very much. And then Sarah Schneer went to World War II. A lot of Jews went from um, Poland to, to Vienna after World War I. And she went there and she was exposed. Oh my God, wow, this is amazing. Girls learning, professionalism. And she wanted to bring that professionalism back. And every summer she'd bring in German scholars to Poland she, to administrator, have, you know, academics, like the people who are like acting. Um, that's maybe academics, perhaps pedagogues, you know, great, great teachers. And right, Beis Yaakov is really modern orthodoxy, but it's not the way it's viewed today. It's really German orthodoxy, correct. Sarish Nier was very not influenced without Hirsch, there wouldn't have been a Sarish, I mean, there would have been a Sarish Nier, but you would have never heard of her. Um, okay, yes. And one can be a teacher without being in the classroom. Of course, we discussed that. Year at Shemaim and Year at go together. Why would the meaning be different? I don't think it is different. Year at Shemaim, uh, I mean, you you're, you want to say that Year at Chet only means fear of sin, as opposed to I'm saying awe. 
maybe your chet does have a little bit of that connotation. Maybe Rav Slavich, maybe it's not just there, but I also think it means to be an awe of sin. What do I mean? Be an awe of sin. I don't mean awe like sin is great. It's like, oh my God. It's not that we're afraid to sin. It's like we, we have to be uninspired. Like Yira means inspiration. We're in awe. We're in, wow, we see something. And I just, my lips are, my, I, I have nothing to say. I can't, I can't do anything. I just look at the Grand Canyon and all I can do, God, is to praise God for his creation. So I, I see the sin. Oh my God, how can I do that? So I don't know that Yerat Chet has to be fear, visceral fear, like Pachat. Pachat is like, you're, you're afraid, you're shaking. Like, you know, missiles are flying in, whatever, God forbid. And that, that's what Pachat. So that's only Rav Salvation. That's on Yom Kippur and Rav Salvation. We don't have time to discuss it now. Discusses how that's uh, how uh, in Allah Shuva, a beautiful piece, how a psychiatrist came to Rav Salvechik, explained how can we say it's not right. So may, maybe next week I can pick up on that. Isn't Pachat Yitzchak? Yeah, Pachat Yitzchak. So Yitzchak, maybe Taka was afraid, according to many versions. Uh, that's a uh, Gil, uh, Gil Pearl gave a whole class on that this summer on all the pictures, the art describing the Akedah, and Rabbi Lichtenstein said, and some versions, Yitzchak was uh, yelling at him, he was pleading with Ephraim. I'll tell you also next week, something that uh, Rabbi Allen here in Toronto, Savoka Darshul, unbelievable, quoting a piyut of Rabbi Lezer HaKalir on Shavuos, please remind me if I forget, it was like mind boggling what Rabbi Lezer HaKalir said about Avram Avinu in the piyut team that none of us say, I think none of us say, on, on Shavuot, but um, so I don't know, you have to think about that more, Pachar is a phrase, does that mean fear or maybe in a different context? Listen, it could be the same word, it's like a different context, but I, I hear that point, I have to think about that. Okay, uh, humans and Hashem, of course, we're God's partners, of course. We ask, what are the relationship between other living beings and Hashem? Okay, please God, next week, also re remind me, I, gotta write, I don't have a pen with me, I have to write these things down, so I'll remember. Okay, you wanna know what the difference is between being living beings and a shem, a shem. I said Rabbi Allen's, and I said Pachet Yitzchak. So I'll try to do some work on that. Hopefully, I'll have some time, busy time. Okay, is Sela an extra strong amen? Somebody asked me privately. Probably a main Sela. I don't know exactly. Sela is really work. Okay, I'm not sure 100. percent Okay. Anyways, um, a pleasure seeing everybody. I want to wish everybody a Shabbat Shalom. Sunday morning, Rabbi Liebpak starting his series on what went wrong in, in the desert. We know a lot of things went wrong in the desert. So uh, we spent 40 years there. And uh, okay, want to wish everybody well. And um, okay, Shabbat Shalom. We look forward to seeing you Sunday. Also on, on Tuesday, Lori Novak will be starting. I think she's starting at 2 or 2.30. I forget the exact time. We'll send out Lori Novak. We'll be back after a little bit of a hiatus. She wanted to do reading the Talmud with Levinus. So um, the philosopher, the French philosopher. So uh, everybody's invited to uh, join that new series next week. And uh, we look forward to learning to do. And as always, please invite a friend. And uh, everybody be well. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you. Very Shabbat great Shalom. Shabbat. Good Shabbos. Thank you. Thank you. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos. Thank you. 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 Okay. Well, Shabbat Shalom. Good Shabbos. Good Shabbos.